Okay, we'll just use the keyboard then. Um, so this paper is, is motivated by us realizing that there are, are sort of two very divergent views on sectors in development. Uh, so the first is the literature that, that Berthold has worked a lot in, which is structural transformation. And the way people in the structural transformation literature think about this is that they say that um, they, they write down models where they are assuming implicitly or explicitly that labor is efficiently allocated throughout development. And then the game that they're playing is that they're going to try to find a sequence of preferences and technologies so that as a country develops, structural transformation is a consequence of development. Okay, so there's some non-homothetic preferences or some particular structure of the production functions. The economy grows and that generates structural transformation. And I'm citing here, I could cite pretty much everybody in this room, I'm citing the handbook chapter and we'll just call it at that. At the same time, there's a, a second literature which I guess I work on a little bit more which is the sectoral productivity gap literature. And what people in this literature do is they start with the data and they document that there are large gaps in labor productivity. Think of here value added per worker or value added per hour between different sectors within an economy. So for example, the most common split is to compare agriculture to non-agriculture, and what you'll find is that reported value added per worker in most poor countries is five to 10 times higher in, in non-agriculture than it is in agriculture. What many but not all papers in this literature conclude is that that must imply that the allocation of labor is inefficient. Not everybody, but quite a few. If you think that allocation of labor is inefficient, that that says that policies that promote structural transformation would induce growth. And you hear a few citations as well. What's interesting about that, I think, is that the, these two sets of papers have basically opposite causality. In one case, structural transformation generates growth. In the other case, growth generates structural transformation. In one case, it's efficient. In the other case, it's inefficient. That seems like something worth thinking about further. Okay. And so that's what we're going to do in this paper. I'm going to try to get to the point fairly quickly, so this will be the last introduction slide. What we want to do in this paper is, is to study sectoral wages and sectoral human capital. So first, wages is an important step. Most people look at value added per worker. But if you're going to write down models of labor markets, you want to think about the price that allocates workers. What's the price that allocates workers between sectors? Well, that's going to be the wage. Okay. The other nice feature about looking at wages is that we have a lot of statistical techniques. We have a huge labor literature that helps us think about how to analyze wages. So you'll see I'm going to focus a lot on the recent US just because we have such an enormous wealth of different types of data that I can do a lot of different facts and I can do a lot of different cross checks and robustness checks. But at the end I will come back and try to make the point that this is important for thinking about structural transformation both in the US time series from 1940 to today, and then across the set of 13 countries where the income ranges from as high as the US to as low as India. In, in terms of what we're going to document, the basic facts will be these. We're going to find that in general, if you just take wage gaps across sectors, they can be large. Not as large as you would typically find if you measure labor productivity, but still sizable. We will also find that once you measure it correctly, we'll find large human capital gaps between sectors. And, and part of the talk will be me trying to tell you how th we think you should measure human capital gaps and we'll introduce something that's a little new. Once you divide the wage gaps by human capital gaps, we're gonna find that in fact there are small gaps in wage per efficiency unit in poor countries and basically no gaps in that object in rich countries. The wage per efficiency unit, that's going to be our name for the price that allocates weight labor. And so we're going to find that in general there are not large gains to reallocating wage labor. Now what large is, I'll let you decide at the end. I'll show you all the numbers, but that's my way of reading our results. So what I want to do is to start off with some facts about the United States, because that's going to be our laboratory. That's going to be especially important because it's the country where we can do the best job of studying switchers. Uh, I'll do a model, then we'll finish with a cross-country analysis. Uh, so the data set we're going to use, I'm going to focus mostly on the monthly CPS from 1980 to 2014. We're going to do the recent years because that's where we have every source of data we could possibly want. Um, this is a large nationally representative data set. You can pick any of the large nationally representative US data sets, which we have like five of. They're all going to show you the same basic patterns. It's all buried in some appendix in the paper. I want to do as few restrictions as possible, so I'm going to use only employed. You have to look at employed people. I'm going to focus on wage workers who are between 16 and 70 years old and report positive income. So the only one of those that probably bears some scrutiny is that we will indeed focus only on wage workers. In most sectors, in most economies, that's not a very big deal. In agriculture, in most economies, that is a big deal. We're going to basically be throwing out about half of the agricultural labor force to three-fourths of the agricultural labor force in most countries. 
I think there's good reasons to do that, and I'll come back at the end. For now, I want you to think mostly the reason we're doing that is that we have a lot of really well-developed understanding of how to think about the wages of wage workers. When it comes to thinking about the income, the total income of proprietors who own some land, have a few tractors, and also provide their own labor, and how we allocate that income across fact, it's a mess. It's very hard in the data. It's very hard in theory. We have to study the data in terms of sectors. Uh, if we want to do everything in a comparable way between the US over time and across all the countries we have, that means we're going to be restricted right off the bat to 15 sectors. We are further going to aggregate, just for presentational purposes, just to make everything clear so I don't have to show you too many pictures, to four sectors throughout the talk. That's going to be agriculture, which is farming, forestry, fishing. Industry is going to be manufacturing, construction, mining. Then we're going to take the usual service sector and cut it in half. And the reason is that when you start to talk about human capital and skills, services is an enormous sector with a tremendous amount of heterogeneity at this point. Um, so we're going to cut services in half basically on the average number of years of schooling. So part of services has very low average years of schooling. That's wholesale retail, hotels, restaurants, maids, and so forth. And then everybody with more than, I think it's 13 years, but it might be 14 years of schooling. And we're going to call that skilled. So that's public administration, fire, health, education, and so on. It is, yes. yes. So what I would like to do, ideally, of course, is to further disaggregate communications and transport and take the part of it that's the IT sector and push it over. But I can't do that across countries. Because when I go to the cross-country data, communications and transportation is just one of the categories. So I'm going to tie my hands here because I'm just going to want to do something that's consistent. If you want, I can go to the US. And, I mean, in the US, I can do anything I want. I have 455 industries or something. The difference between the industry codes in the US and some other countries is amazing. It's just other countries have like 100 agricultural industry codes. The US has two. So the first fact I want to document is just that there are large wage gaps. And everything I do here is going to be driven by minster wage regressions, but it doesn't really matter how you measure wage gaps. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the log wage of individual I and sector J at time T, that's going to be determined by a, a time fixed effect. That's DT. So you know we're aggregating across time. We need to control for time fixed effects because wages rise. There's inflation, et cetera. Z is going to be just a vector of controls. For most of the talk, that's just going to be state that you live in and your sex. Put more in, I've put left in. It doesn't matter too much. What I really care about is DJ, which is the dummy for your employed in sector J. And again, there's four different possible responses. What I'm going to do today is I'm going to omit agriculture. And so the wage gap I report is always just going to be what's the wage in that sector relative to the wage in agriculture. We do that because agriculture is the lowest paying sector everywhere at every point. When you do that, what you're going to find is large wage gaps. So for instance, this says that unskilled services on average pays 20% more than agriculture. Industry pays 70% more, and skilled services pays as much as 80% more than agriculture, even in the US, even in the last 30 to 40 years. Now, not surprisingly, I'm going to say that part of that is probably due to human capital, and, and probably I've made that very obvious by cutting services into skilled and unskilled. So if you go to the data, you'll find that indeed there are large differences in our usual proxies for human capital. The most important one is going to be education. So services and industry are much more educated than farming. And skilled services, they have almost a full college degree more. I mean, a college degree is four years. They have three and a half more years of schooling than agriculture. And so it's natural to suspect that that helps us explain or account for a large part of the wage gap. The standard way to do this, if you're a macro development person, is to just pull, put this into a Hall and Jones type human capital production function. So the way that works is you just say, well, human capital, log human capital, as just the number of years of schooling times some rate of return. And different people vary in their favorite rate of return. I just like to put in a 10% constant. Hall and Jones have some sort of concave thing. It doesn't really matter which one I pick. I'm going to pick the constant 10. If I do that, I'll find that there are indeed gaps in human capital between sectors, but they're a lot smaller than the wage gaps. The human capital gaps are maybe 20 to 40 percent. And so I'm going to be left with a big, quote unquote, unexplained or residual wage gap between sectors. And then 
if this was a macro development paper and this was called the United Tanzania or something, I would say that there's some sort of barriers that prevent the reallocation of labor across these sectors. And I'm only half kidding. This is something that actual papers have really done. They plug it into this Hall and Jones thing and then they say, well, we can't explain it. It's a puzzle. It's a gap. It's a distortion. It doesn't seem very plausible in the United States. People seem to get off of the farm in the United States just fine. They make it all the way to Arizona. So we want to go a step further. Uh, and what we want to document is sort of our last fact for thinking about human capital is that it's also true that the return to schooling varies a lot by sector in almost all of our economies. Uh, and so in order to establish that, I'm going to run the same mincer wage regression, except now what I'm going to do, there's a big, long, complicated term which basically says I'm going to let the return to schooling vary based on which sector you're in. And there's a lot of stuff here with beta, C, J, C, I, J, T. This captures the unfortunate fact that wages are a convex function of schooling in the United States. What I mean by that is that the return to college years of schooling are much higher than the returns to the first 12 years of schooling. And so that's there just to clean all that up. I'm not going to have many interesting things to say about why wages are convex. This is sort of a well-known thing. I just want to make sure I do this correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to estimate this, and I'm just going to plot the wages as a function of schooling in all four sectors in the CPS. And this is what you see. So at the top, in, in, I'm sorry, here in red is agriculture. Again, that's going to be sort of our default sector. What you can see is even what I'm calling unskilled services, the intercepts are very similar. But the return to schooling is much higher even in this sector called unskilled services. It's much, much higher in skilled services. The differences between agriculture and industry in terms of how valuable the education is is not large. If you let me construct a measure of human capital which takes account not just of the years of schooling but also of the relative return to schooling across these different sectors, what you'll find is that that measure or that construction of human capital accounts for basically all of the wage gaps. Now that might seem like it's by construction. Well, so first let me just say really quickly, what are the numbers? Human capital gap 1.4, 1.4, 2.1. And so the unexplained wage gap is roughly one across these sectors. One means that you're roughly at wage parity. There's not much left to explain. Okay. Now, is that a logical thing to do? Is this really a measure of human capital? I think much of the rest of my time I'm going to try to devote to trying to convince you that the answer is yes. I, I don't think that's obvious right now. Um, in particular, I think it's helpful for me to, to sort of put out for you two views of what these differences in rates of return across sectors might mean. I'm going to call one of them the sectoral view. The sectoral view says that the reason why some sectors have higher returns to schooling than others is just something about the sector itself. It's something intrinsic to the technology of producing in one sector than another. The easy way to say that is just, it's just that things like agriculture and household services aren't very skill intensive. No matter how much skill you have, it's just not going to be very valuable in those sectors. Uh, in this case, I think you probably don't want to include these differences in returns to schooling in a measure of human capital. It's really something about the technology, not something about the human capital of the people in that sector. The alternative view is I'm going to call it just, just for convenience the selection view. And what this says is that really uh, it's differences in workers. Some workers are more able or they've gotten a better quality of schooling. That's why they have steeper returns to schooling or a higher return on their schooling. And what we're seeing in the data is that lower ability workers are selecting to work in agriculture or household services. And if you were willing to believe this point of view, then you would say that indeed I should be counting this in my measure of human capital because what I'm really doing is measuring some sort of selection on what we would typically think of as an unobservable characteristic. How can I tell the difference between these two? Because obviously I think they give you very different views on how to think about the data and how we should construct human capital, a priori, I don't see any way to just say, ah, clearly it's one and not two or two and not one. So what I want to do is give you a very simplified view of a model to think through how this would work, how one view would look at the data versus the other. And I'll come back and talk a little bit about evidence from people who switch. The idea is that both of these are going to point in the same direction. I don't think either is ironclad. But hopefully with the two of them together, I can convince you that the selection view somehow is a more sensible way to think about these data. Okay. I'm going to abstract from most of the parts of the model. We've got everything specified very nicely so that you can describe equilibrium and market clearing conditions and so on and so forth. But really what the model is about is imagine we have a world where there's a large number of individuals. 
There's heterogeneity in the economy in the sense that people potentially differ in their innate ability, X. This is the thing that we can't observe, usually. And they also differ or have heterogeneity in the years of schooling. That's something that we can observe in almost every data set. Uh, and then we're going to think that an individual with characteristics Xn provides Hjxn units of labor. The rest of the model is just a very complicated way to rig to make sure that we have some people in every sector in equilibrium. So it was just a specification of preferences and market clearing so that that's the case. I'm, I'm not presenting that today. And we're going to make a very nice assumption on the production function that allows us to talk about this, I think, in a sensible way. So we're going to assume that the amount of human capital or the amounts of output a person produces, if they have characteristics Xn, and they work in sector J is just given by this very simple functional form. Now again, this beta C, C, N, that's just to clean up the non-convexity in, in returns to schooling. Ignore that. I thought about just removing it last night, and I decided not to, but anyway, I should have. I don't want to talk about it. So again, remember that N is the number of years of schooling. And so what you can see in this functional form is that there's two reasons why the return to schooling might vary across sectors. One is that it could be that people with very different X's are selecting in the different sectors in equilibrium. The other is that it could be that gamma J, the technology of the sector just differs. And so that corresponds exactly to the selection and sectoral views I was trying to describe earlier. And so then what we're going to do is just think about how can it be that I can get workers of different types to select into these sectors, or how can I rationalize the sectoral view? The only other thing I need to tell you about is that we're going to imagine in the background that there's some government which has the power to distort allocations. I don't know why we call this a government. You know how these models work. Tau J is just some reason why the, uh, the, the data doesn't obey our first order, first order conditions of our model. That could be the government. It could be all sorts of different things. But anyway, so Tau J is going to be our sector J tax or sector J barrier. So when you work through this model, it becomes very hard to rationalize the sectoral view with what we see in the US data. So let me give you the picture version of the proof and then skip the actual proof. So the picture version of the proof is very straightforward. So here's what you would need to see in the data if you wanted to believe the sectoral view. And again, remember, I'm using sectoral view to describe the idea that maybe there's just differences in the types of technologies you use in the two sectors. So what I'm plotting here is a hypothetical world where I see that the years of schooling from 0 to 20 Let's imagine there's no selection because everybody's the same. They have different years of schooling, but there's no heterogeneity and unobserved ability. Okay, I want to pin this all on sectoral differences. I can do that if I see wage functions that look like this. Okay? If the wages in equilibrium look like this, then what I can imagine in my mind is, OK, well, we have heterogeneity in years of schooling. And so in equilibrium, everybody who has 12 years of schooling or less, they're going to see that agriculture pays them a higher wage. And everybody with more than 12 years of schooling, they're going to see that Non-agriculture pays a higher wage. And that's sort of a sensible way to think about an equilibrium. There's no unobserved ability. So it's just that low education people work in agriculture, highly educated people in non-agriculture. We have labor supplied to both of the two sectors. Everything seems very logical. And indeed, this is a labor market model we might have written down of, of how uh, structural transformation works. Okay, so this is the type of thing we need to see if we want to believe in the sectoral view. The problem is when you look at the actual US data, again, it looks nothing like that. So you have two problems. The first problem you run into is that industry pays higher than all the other sectors at every possible level of education. It's pretty hard to rationalize that with the sectoral view. If everybody is intrinsically the same, then they should all just want to go work for industry. All right, let's ignore that. Even if you ignore that, the next problem you have is that skilled services pays everybody with more than seven and a half years of schooling a higher wage. So if you want to take the sectoral view of what's going on here, you would say that, well, everybody with zero to one years of schooling should choose agriculture. And everybody with between one and three years of schooling should choose to work in, uh, what is that, unskilled services. And everybody who's more than about five years of schooling should work in skilled services, uh, except that all American workers have more than eight years of schooling. And so it's just very hard logically to think through this and say, well, if there's no differences in unobserved ability, if schooling is all I see, then basically all of the workers should be in either industry or maybe skilled services. On the other hand, it's pretty easy to rationalize this with the selection view. What the selection view would tell you is that the reason these lines differ, their slopes differ, is just that the workers are of different types. And there's a proposition which describes a unique equilibrium where all of that works out very nicely. But in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it. 
The other way you can think about this is to look at switchers. And the idea behind looking at switchers is very simple. So what I'm gonna do is look at people who in some year T work in one sector, and in the next year T plus one they work in a different sector. Under the selection view, this is all down to their human capital, some of which is unobserved. So when they switch sectors, their wages shouldn't change very much. And under the sectoral view, the reason why I see these huge differences in rate of return is just that some technologies will better, some sectors will better use their skills than others. I should see large wage changes when they switch across sectors. That's the basic test I'm going for here. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just compare the wage change that people see at switching to the raw wage gap. So if you move from agriculture to industry, how much wage does your wage go up relative to the total gap between agriculture and industry? Okay, and like I say here, the selection view says you shouldn't see anything. Sectoral view says the change should be the raw wage. So I'm gonna just show you, obviously I can study wages for workers in each of the four sectors, switching to each of the four sectors. So I could show you as many as 16 possible wage changes. There's two data sets in the US which you can really do this in a reasonable way. And they each have sort of advantages and drawbacks. Uh, in the CPS, CPS is kind of nice because it is a humongous sample size and it's what I've already used. So I'm gonna do that. The only drawback to the CPS is that it's not really designed as a panel survey. If you really work very hard at it, you can make a pseudo panel out of it where you follow people for one year and you can follow about two thirds of the total sample. So there's some tricks there and I think it's not ideal. The PSID, as you can guess from the fact that it's called the panel survey, is indeed designed to follow people over time. Uh, the drawback to the PSID is that it has a very small sample size. Fortunately, both of them show the same basic conclusion, so let me show you what that is. This is, this is just very simple data. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking, let's just focus on the first row. I'm looking in the CPS at people who switch from agriculture to industry. I have about 1,700 of those over the last 35 years. When they move from agriculture to industry, their wages rise by about 11%. That's what 1.11 means. But the total gap is that on average, industry workers make 68% more than agricultural workers. Hmm? So since I'm following, in, this, in the right-hand column, no. No, because what I want to know implicitly is how much of this total wage gap is due to human capital. No, no. He's agreeing with me about the change. He's just asking, what's the right denominator? So I'm saying that 11% is small relative to 68%, and you're saying, I think the human capital corrected figure is more like 35% or something. And so you wanna know what that figure is. It's still gonna be a small proportion of the total, but obviously not as small as this. Okay. If you go down all of these columns, or I'm sorry, if you go down every row of this, you're gonna find over and over again the same picture, which is that the wage gap always goes in this, the wage change. Yeah. This is CPS, PSID is in the next slide. There's a full set of year dummies and all sorts of, yeah, yeah. I can only do that in the PSID, you're right. In the CPS, you can only follow for a year. I'll show you the PSID in just a minute. Yep, yep, yep. So really quickly, what I want you to see is that in almost every case, the direction of the wage change is the same as the direction of the wage gap. So. If the wage gap is, net, is less than one, so is the wage change. If the wage gap is more than one, so is the wage change, but it's always relatively small. It's on the order of 15 to 25% of the total gap. And so that suggests that this is mostly down to selection, that most of, when they move, what we see is that their wages don't move a lot. That suggests that it's something mostly about the workers and not about the sectors. And then this is the PSID. Um, so as you can see, I want you to notice three things. So the first is that in this column, you'll see that the observations are a lot smaller. Yes, ID is just a much smaller sample size. If you look at this column, you can see what's the one year wage change. And here I've given you now the two year wage change. I've tried to do three, the sample size starts plummeting towards zero basically because you have a lot of attrition, even in the PSID. Um, this is the wage gap. So the wage gaps are roughly similar to what we saw before. Uh, there's a typo there, that's supposed to be 1.13 anyway. 
Uh, this is the one-year wage change. You can see, again, both the one- and two-year wage changes are pretty small. The two-year wage change is not necessarily much bigger than the one-year wage change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you mean the old occupation or the new one? That's just the average. I can also do a, a related exercise where I only look at basically young people to compute the wage gap, and I look at only young people who switch, which I think there's some good reasons to think about doing, uh, and you're going to find very similar results. Most of the people who switch are very young, so maybe dividing by the wage gap for the young makes sense. And that's in an appendix buried somewhere with all the 5,000 other robustness checks. So I thought a lot about whether this would be a big problem. Let's go back to the bigger sample size because I can make the point more clearly. If you think that's what's going on, Can I answer that afterwards? I have a great answer, but it's very long, and I, I sort of want to give the discussants enough time and the coffee break enough time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a clarifying question. He wanted to know if I had ever thought about something important. <laughs> <laughs> so what does this have to do with structural transformation? Okay. No, no, no. no. It's just it's going to take me five minutes to make the point. So. Uh, so what I want to do is link this now to structural transformation, the idea that we should measure human capital and include these sectoral returns to schooling. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at structural transformation two ways. I'm going to follow the US over time. We can get in the US wage data back to 1940. And then I want to look across countries and across GDP per capita with every country I can get from IPMs. I want to use IPMs because they've done a lot of harmonization work for me. Most importantly, they harmonize industries and occupations, which, as you can guess, is pretty fundamental to the points I'm trying to make. So when I say agriculture, I want to make sure that agriculture is roughly the same thing in all of these very different countries. So I just want to kind of give you two main takeaways from looking at this in terms of structural transformation. So what I've plotted here is the returns to schooling in the left for the US over time and the right across countries plotted by GDP per capita. So you can think of this as moving along structural transformation in both cases. And what I want you to see here is that in general it is consistently true, I mean not every single case, but agriculture comes out very low in terms of returns to schooling in the US throughout time and across countries. Unskilled services is roughly next in most cases, in some cases it's industry, and skilled services consistently has a much higher returns to schooling than all the other sectors. There's some noise because I'm measuring this regression by regression, country by country, year by year. In some cases you get something a little different, but those are the broad trends. No, um, I'm controlling for gender in the regressions. I've also done everything with just men because I worry about this because of your, your papers, in fact. <laughs> um, the decline here has to, do with the, it has to do with the convexification of wages. So if you go back to 1960, wages are linear. And what we see since 1960, especially in the US, is that the first 12 years of schooling, you're seeing a lower return and then a higher return to subsequent years. What I'm plotting here is just the return to the first 12, just for clarification. I can show you all the figures of everything else, but that's, the, that's what's going on. So this suggests that if we take this into account across countries, on average, this is going to help us close those wage gaps because it seems to be consistently the case that skilled services pays a much higher return to schooling. And I've tried to give you some idea that this might measure selection of who chooses to work in the skilled service sector. And so this is what you get if you look at wage gaps. I'm going to do these one at a time. So let's start with the US time series. So what I'm plotting here is just the raw wage gap. And then the wage gap you get is you make subsequent adjustments. In the interest of time, let me just say, really, let's just really quickly focus on the red, which is the wage gap you see in the data, and then the yellow, which is what you get after you adjust for sectoral returns to schooling. So you can see, first of all, that in the US, wage gaps used to be larger, and they're declining over time. Then you can see that if you adjust, especially for sectoral returns to schooling, those gaps, not perfectly closed, but they're much smaller. 
even as early as 1940, you see that the gaps are maybe 50%. Industry is really high in 1940 because of unionization and FDR. Uh, and unskilled services is maybe 40, 50%. Is that big or small? I'm going to call that a small number. Only because if you go to the people who look at productivity gaps, the productivity gaps across sectors are on the order of factor of 5 to factor of 10. 50% is small relative to a factor of 5 or factor of 10. Then I'm going to do the same exact exercise now looking across countries. So instead of the US, this is all the different countries plotted against GDP per capita. Really quickly, I did change the scale here. I had to make it a log scale that goes up to a factor of 8 because across countries the gaps get much bigger. But you see the same basic idea. For poor countries, once you adjust for the sectoral returns to schooling, there are gaps, but on the order of like 40 to 50 percent. And those gaps close pretty quickly. Once you get to something like 4 to 8,000, there's just not much of a gap left on average. The same thing is true in unskilled services. The same thing is true in industry. Industry is consistently the one that closes the least. And so, well, almost to the conclusion, I should just go there. Yep. Uh, so the, in terms of conclusion, I think there's two things. The first is we want to propose here a new construction of human capital at the sectoral level, which obviously is going to be big if you're thinking about sectoral gaps, if you're thinking about structural transformation. And the main idea here is that you want to adjust when you do that for sectoral returns to schooling, which differ a lot across countries and sectors in a very consistent way. And we're trying to argue that that captures some sort of selection on unobservables, but of course, since we're observing it, they must not be perfectly unobservable. In terms of the literature, I think what we've noticed here is that there are surprisingly small sectoral wage gaps, even before you adjust, but especially after you adjust. Wage gaps are just really very small. So for the structural transformation literature that wants to assume that workers are roughly efficiently allocated, I'd say that's about right. Now, how do you square this with people who are measuring big productivity gaps? This is where I want to come back to what I said at the very beginning. We've focused throughout here on wage workers especially in poor countries and especially in agriculture and especially in poor country. Agriculture, most workers, more than half, are going to be self-employed. So what this suggests is that the people who are working for wages seem to be roughly efficiently allocated, roughly 50%. It's not a small number, I know. I'd like a 50% raise, but close enough. So that would suggest that if you want to find some really big gaps, you might want to think about the self-employed, and in particular, the fact that they own their own land and they own their own capital. If you're going to write down models to try to explain these large sectoral gaps, those models need to take seriously the idea that these are not just wage workers. Wage workers are not very interesting. The interesting people seem to be the self-employed, the proprietors, the landowners. What's special about them that creates these big productivity gaps? And I'll stop there. All right. So I guess there's not, I'm not sure, there's probably not much point in summarizing, but it's a tradition. So. Um, you're estimating the returns to education in different sectors. Of course, for, there's several, again, there's several steps, right? First of all, you're showing us that um, there are these big wage gaps, and then um, later on, um, they become much weaker if you uh, get rid of the imposition of there being constant returns to education across the sectors. And then, of course, there's the model with selection. But then, of course, you come back to the data to look at switchers and to look at the international data and so on, as we saw in the presentation. So really, a lot of steps. And as I said, I think this is very interesting, patient, and thorough work. And it probably took a long time to keep bringing in the next check, the next check, the next check. And a lot of, as you said, is in the appendix. So um, most readers probably won't even see how much went into it. Um, I guess this is one of the key graphs of the paper, and so I wanted to start off by thinking about it because um, the way you put it in your presentation, there were, this graph was actually really important, among other things, um, for suggesting that what you're calling the sectorial hypothesis probably can't do really that much because, as you put it, for example, if this is what's going on and there's no sorting, right? then what this tells you is everyone should be in industry, and so on. And then, you, of course, you can change that by saying, um, well, as in your paper, actually, I think if I recall correctly, a lot of the difference between industry here and the intercept actually has to do with um, construction and mining, where, of course, the jobs are much more dangerous and um, <coughs> Though some aspects of farming are pretty dangerous too, but anyway, or I guess forestry. Um, if we really wanted to put that in and you know think of that as being a non-dollar wage thing or that there's a wage premium for that, then this thing might get also closer together. 
Um, the profiles, of course, are still different. But I guess what, me, what this got me thinking about was um, there's a sense of time in this paper. Actually, there are two senses of time in this paper. One is uh, the time of the date that the person's wage is being paid at. Another sense is the time they spent in school, which, of course, is already a given for every single person in this data set, right? No one's studying anymore. Um, but there's a third aspect of time that came up in some of the questions, and that's um, the time you spend in a particular, well, I guess, again, that's, let's call it experience. And we can think of experience in several ways. One might be just the time you've been in the labor market, right? Then something someone said sounded like it was hinting at the idea that maybe what matters is not so much how much time you spent in the labor market, but how much time you spent in that particular sector, right? It's not quite the same. Um, at least for the United States, my understanding is that a typical person changes, um, actually no, the data I'm thinking about is not changing sector, it's changing career where you have to change sector and occupation. I think the average is like twice in your lifetime usually. So it's not that unusual, it's also not that common. So it's not clear. Um, and indeed it's mainly young people, as you're saying. So um, I wanted to think about how that might affect anything that we're doing here, either theoretically or, um, actually, let's forget about that, um, or, or more likely empirically. And I'm wondering about the extent to which it means that, um, well, for one thing, it means that if the, in a world where experience matters, especially if experience, rather than just being time, is actually something that is, oh, experience could be a byproduct of producing, right? That's one way in which people write down models with experience. But experience could also be the opposite. It could be something that I accumulate when I'm in my job, but instead of operating whatever production technology there is, I actually have to take time off and operate a, an experience producing thing. In other words, it takes separate effort. Um, which may not affect my wage right now, but it's certainly something that, actually, it's not clear, right? Would I, am I being paid for that hour that I'm studying how to use the tractor rather than driving it around? I'm not sure, but probably varies by sector too. But anyway, so those, those two worlds are very different ways of writing down a model with experience. Experience is something that we think of as being one dimension of human capital. And as best I understood, it's not in the paper. Now, of course, um, so I guess, again, which model of experience do you really want to have in mind? If you wanted to put it in your regressions, I'm not sure. Um, again, if people aren't switching that much between sectors, for example, maybe it doesn't matter too much anyway. Right? This time on the labor market is going to be a good proxy for all of them, I guess. Um, but again, there, it, exactly what happens is going to depend, or exactly what kind of bias or interaction or whatever issues might come up is going to depend on which way you want to think about experience. And again, clearly several people in this room thought about that as they were listening, right? So um, actually, and actually the key thing is going to be, of course, or a key thing is going to be whether there's any sort of interaction between um, whatever technology produces experience, whether it's just a byproduct of making stuff or um, something that you have to take time away from production in order to generate. And schooling. Because right? maybe, again, one of the things that um, maybe there are certain kinds of jobs um, where, actually, there are just, again, so many possibilities. And rather than go, then imagine all of them by waving my hands, I mean, here are a couple of examples. So this is your equation, equation x, this is not numbered in the paper I saw, where this is the last one in the first empirical section, right? So now here we have a possibility, actually N is time in schooling, C is time in college, D is a sector dummy, right? And the, we're allowing these coefficients here to vary across sectors, and this is the equation where when you estimate this, I believe um, this thing, which is the residual wage gap, right? Um, kind of gets small, right? That's, that's, I think that's the right way to read this. So now let's imagine instead that there is some... Two minutes? Okay, I can speed up. I can talk very fast. <laughs> 
So now we have experience here, right? E, let's call it E, and let's just pretend it's the time you spent working, right? Then um, um, that's going to be my age minus whatever time I spent in school. So of course, it's negatively correlated with schooling, right? And then minus five or whatever, whenever you start school. So now suddenly we have, um, well, we have a, a, a missing variable here that's actually correlated with everything that's very interesting here. And so it's not clear what's going to happen. On the other hand, oh dear, oh, there we go. Um, and of course, it's getting going to get even messier because um, education may be correlated with unobserved heterogeneity. So now we have all of the things that are interesting here being um, tied together. Here's a completely different way of thinking about experience. And that this one, what I've done is I've said that experience actually interacts with education. I don't know what the sign of this thing is here. But, um, right, so then uh, maybe um, economics professors learn a lot. Uh, PhD, people with PhDs maybe continue learning a lot on the job, right? Whereas uh, farmers with low schooling maybe do, maybe don't. I don't know. It could be sector specific. That's, that's what I've written here, right? A farmer with a PhD, I don't know what happens to him or her. So now this error in equation X is, has got experience and uh, education here. So again, things are getting tied together in, um, in a way that uh, I guess in this case, probably the sign of whatever happens might be op the opposite if we think of, well, and actually if I break this down the way I did before and define education the same way, and suddenly my error is actually correlated with n squared. So, um, well, we had this convex return to education. Maybe it's coming out from here. So I'm not saying that um, selection is probably not important, and we don't need to do this to actually see the value of what this work is, of course. Um, but it might be useful to find, see if there's some way, since you already did 5,000 robustness checks. Maybe you can do 5,001. To get this taken care of, right? Um, and again, part of the problem is that I have seen lots of papers where education is, mo sorry, experience is modeled in very different ways. Of course, here the question is partly about it, how experience interacts with unobserved heterogeneity. Maybe my unobserved, maybe, so maybe, and you know, one interpretation is, that's fine. We're just cap um, whether you interpret this unobserved heterogeneity as being one thing or another, it's still the same thing. Or whether we're sorting because some people gain more experience than others because of their unobserved heterogeneity. I don't care. I am still capturing the same thing. It's not changing my argument. But okay. But so I have, no, I have seven to go because you had twelve. So um, <clears throat> anyway, I'm done. And about the switchers. Um, again, since, um, you know, when I'm switching, it's, um, and I'm, I'm not switching because of my wage right now necessarily. Again, in the world with experience, I want to stay somewhere. And I'm switching because of what I think is going to happen maybe a long time ago. So in that case, my current wage gap, when I just switched, isn't really telling me very much. Like, I know a guy who left the IMF, which pays really well and gives you a heck of a lot of job security. Very different dimensions, right? For a hedge fund in London, right? And he took, probably took a wage cut to do that. But on the other hand, if he does a good job there, you know, sky's the limit. So, and we're not gonna see that, I don't know, how long does it take to get, be a partner when you start up in one of these places? A lot later, right? So that's why the switching studies, I think, are interesting, but I guess it's gonna be probably imp impossible to look at your wage gap 10 years later after switching. So there's probably not much we can do in that di dimension. So I guess I'm done, but this is just a, I mean, the only thing I could imagine is a structural model with switching experience and everything along these lines. And so there's one of them. <laughs> Sorry? Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, now questions. Uh, from anyone? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm actually wondering because the, the years of schooling is just a 
rough measure of human capital, and you argued that it's a very good one, and we're using that. But still, I mean, people with the same years of school can have very different skills. Uh, and uh, there is recent work by Glenda Quintini and other people at the OECD who showed that, like, especially in the US, the inequality in the skill supply at the individual level and the differences in the skill use and also returns to particular skills, like numeracy, literacy, problem solving, are huge, one of the bigger in the in the entire OECD. So I am wondering if you could use, let's say, the PIAG data for the US and check that if you control for the measures for literacy, numeracy, problem solving, if these differences in returns between sectors do hold. Because it might be the case that just industry pays more for numeracy skills, which we don't really observe at the, at the years of schooling level, whereas agriculture does not pay. And that could explain a part of this, of this gap. The, how, how do you know that the switches are not uh, selecting? I mean, you have the same selection problem with switches as you had with the initial uh, entry, in which case the test would be irrelevant. Yeah, no, I'll be, I'll be brief, thank you. Thanks for the comments, and I'll come back to the selection thing. Maybe during the coffee break, I'll come ask you. I have some idea, but it's not easy to explain somehow. Um, so most, I just want to say thank you. Uh, thanks for the comment. I'll ask you about this data later. I would love to do it, if it's nationally representative. The usual reason why we use years of schooling as a macro development person is obvious. It's, it's not some deep, profound rightness of years of schooling. It's availability, plain and simple. So if we have something better, I'd love to check. In terms of experience, Roberto, it's somewhere in one of the appendices, I promise. Maybe it got lost somewhere, but it's, it's all cleaned up in many different ways. I've thought a lot about experience and returns to experience across countries, so it would be very remiss of me not to have done it. I have, it just doesn't make much of a difference. So in the main storytelling of the main line of the paper, you won't find it, because it just doesn't add much to the story we're telling there. Um, and I, I'll just stop there so we can have some coffee. Thank you. So I have to, if I want to do, I can do, I've been thinking about this. I mean, I just have to aggregate data in some way. Everybody who's six to 10 years from switching or something. I'll try it. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. But PSID, people don't realize, PSID is just not many people. You're looking for people who switch from education to farming. <laughs>